presence is here and we know that your word declares that in your presence is fullness of joy so lord as we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise may our hearts rejoice for all that you are and for all that you have done we give you thanks in jesus name and i want to hear everybody say amen, amen. hallelujah let's worship today Jesus is risen. This here is a celebration. I've got joy in the morning, joy in the evening. Christ is alive. That is the reason. Whatever comes tomorrow, I've got joy. Amen.
come on, keep putting your hands together. We're not through praising yet. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen? I want you to say this with me. After I, I say it, I want you to repeat it. Let everything, let everything that has breath that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything, let everything that has breath that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I praise when. Praise when I'm number, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the waters, my enemies drown him. Come on. As long as
mighty shout of praise to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, I tell you what, it sure is good to be in the house of God today. Woo! I tell you what, we have an amazing time today. First of all, Praise team, thank you so much for the amazing job that you did. Give them a round of applause. It is so good to be in the house. You can just sit down for just a minute here. I know that y'all are excited. Y'all want to keep praising and dancing and enjoying yourselves this morning. But we've got uh, a special uh, time this morning that we are excited about. Trinity Preschool is in the house, y'all. Can we give it up for Trinity Preschool? Yeah, very good. Uh, I believe that Gabby, uh, Miss Gabby and Miss Melissa, maybe they're backstage, or I don't know where they are exactly. Yeah, oh, there they are. Wave at everybody. They're the directors here at the, uh, for the preschool. We're so glad to have them here. Today we have uh, a special uh, performance by some of our preschoolers. They're going to come and they're going to bless our heart, and so we're excited about that. So if y'all want to go ahead and get in place and uh, get ready, and we're going to just be blessed by that. And so while y'all are doing that, I just want to take the opportunity to welcome all of you who are joining us online. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I know that uh, if you could, you'd be here, but I want you to know that God's got something special planned for you today. Right where you're at, there is nothing that hinders God's presence from touching you right where you are. There in your home, the Bible says that where you are, He is there. And so we want you to know that we love you, that we're praying for you, and we're believing great things for you. If you need a touch from the Lord today, you're at the right place. I know that God has something special for you. So as we uh, get ready to have this special performance by the preschool, would you, would you just uh, give them a warm welcome, a warm round of applause? All right.
Give them one more round of applause. God is awesome. We are so excited. Great job, everybody. So we've got a special time for you this morning. Uh, here in just a, a little bit, we'll be having the Easter egg hunt for the kiddos, and they're going to have lots of fun. But, uh, Arby, could you bring that over here for me? But I tell you what, it's, it's good to be here this morning. I'm not going to keep you very long. I know that we all have uh, fun and family and fellowship and food. I, I mean, I could keep going, but, but mainly the food and the fun and the family and the fellowship and the food. Did I say food already? I must be starting to get hungry a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, I tell you what. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm not going to keep you here too long. If any of y'all, is there any good barbecuers in the house? Does anybody know how to do good? Well, there's one. Right there. Okay. Are y'all inviting me later? Is that? Okay. Great. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Well, I tell you what, there's nothing like uh, family uh, on this time that we have on Easter Sunday getting together and, and just enjoying each other and celebrating the goodness of God. And that's what we want to do for just a moment is just kind of pause and reflect about what all of this means and why we do all the things that we do. And so let's look at the story of the resurrection together for just a moment. And it's found in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. And it reads this way. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was set at Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and then returned from the tomb and told all of these things to the eleven and all the rest. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate today because you came and you gave yourself, but you rose again. And so we thank you and we praise you for this. And I pray that your word, Lord, would speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you say Jesus is alive? Come on. Say he is alive. Glory to God. You know, growing up, I remember as a child that there was, I would see these pictures of Jesus and I, was, I would always wonder, it was, it was confusing to me, but I always wondered, how did they know what Jesus looked like? Does anybody else there with me? <laughs> we had a children's Bible in the house filled with these amazing pictures of David and Goliath and Daniel in the lion's den and Jesus multiplying the little boy's lunch to feed the 5,000. Before I could read, I knew these stories by heart and would rehearse them in my mind as I looked at the pictures. There was the one of Jesus standing in the boat, rebuking the storm as the disciples were all gripped with fear. One of my favorites was a picture of Jesus sitting down while all of the little children ran to him. Some were sitting on his lap, some were sitting on the ground in front of him. Some were dancing around as he hugged and blessed and held each of them. Everyone seemed so happy in this picture. They all wanted to be with Jesus, and Jesus wanted to be with them. I remember feeling so warm inside, knowing that even though I was just a child, Jesus loved me, and he cared for me. Do you all remember that song? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me. Y'all did so good. Give yourselves a round of applause, I tell you. Of course, there was the picture of Jesus 
hanging on a cross. I remember looking at that picture and wondering to myself, how could someone who was so nice, so loving, and who did so many good things for everyone, be treated so badly. Why did he have to die like that? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why did Jesus have to die? I'm sure we've all heard the answer that Jesus died to save us from our sins. But how many of us really feel like we're such bad people that we deserve death? I mean... Most of it, people have, have not murdered others. We don't steal. We don't sit around plotting ways to harm people. If you do, we have, we have there's counseling for you. <laughs> we aren't evil. Most of us try to care for our neighbor as best we can. We try to be unselfish. We try to make the world a better place. So why did we all have a death sentence? Have you ever gotten sick because you were around somebody else who was sick and you didn't know it? I think that we shut down the whole world in 2020 because of something like that. I'm sorry, a couple of you guys, I can see your eye twitch and we'll just move on. We'll just move on that. What we have to understand is that all of humanity has been given a deadly diagnosis. Not because of anything we have done, but simply because of our DNA. You see, some of us get sick because we were exposed to a bacteria or a virus, but some sickness is hereditary. It's passed down to us through our bloodline. This is what humanity has. To understand this, we have to visit another picture in the story Bible. In this picture, we see a man and a woman standing under a tree in the middle of a garden. And in the tree is a snake with this evil look on his face. The man and the woman both have taken a bite from the fruit of that tree. And they're both looking at each other with a look of fear and dismay as if they had just discovered something horrible. This is the story of Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman. Both have been created by God and placed to live in a garden that God had prepared for them. It was the most beautiful garden that has ever existed. Everything that they could possibly want was there for them to enjoy. It was paradise. All was in perfect harmony. There was just one caveat. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God warned them not to eat of its fruit because it was deadly. He told them, if you eat it, it's going to kill you. You see, God created Adam and Eve to be like him. In Genesis 1.26, we see God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, God is eternal, right? Yes, God is eternal. He doesn't die. So God's creation was never meant to die. God's original design for us was that we would live forever. But there was one other thing that being created in God's image gave us. A free will. Each of us has the freedom to make our own choices. Unfortunately for us, each of us in this room, 
The choice that Adam and Eve made that day had a permanent effect on all of us. They chose to partake of the one thing that was poison to them. It was an irreversible, deadly virus that would forever alter the DNA of humanity. The knowledge of evil. The tree was called the knowledge of good and evil, but they had no need to gain the knowledge of good because they already knew good. They knew God, the source of all that is good. They were surrounded by his goodness. The deadly poison that they took that day The DNA-altering virus that corrupted all of humanity was the knowledge of evil. As evil entered their heart, their mind, their soul, and their spirit, their entire eternal body began to die. Suddenly, this perfect world became a scary place to live as fear and doubt and worry, and anger, and hatred, and jealousy, and lust, and pride, and all that is pure evil flooded their being and latched on to their DNA, causing death to become imminent. It was a tragic day, resulting in a deadly outcome for all of humanity. If only they had listened. If only they had obeyed God's voice. The pain and the suffering that we see all around us, the pure evil that seems to be on full display throughout society, the sting of death lurking in the shadows and looming around every corner would have never seen the light of day. Yet here we are. Every one of us is born dying. From the moment that we take our first breath, we begin to cry as our body begins the fight for survival that ultimately ends in death. My friend, you are not the most evil person in the world. Give yourself a pat on the back. (laughs) You may be a good person according to society's standards, but even on your best today, there's still something inside of you, a battle that you're fighting between right and wrong, good and evil. Even our greatest acts of generosity in those moments, there are still seeds of selfishness. In our greatest moments of courage, we are plagued by anxiety and fear. Our best efforts to discern what is right are clouded by our impure motivations and limited understanding. The Bible says it this way, In Proverbs 14, it says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Romans chapter 7, verse 21 says, So I find the law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 says this, We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sin sweeps us away like the wind. Even Jesus, trying to make the point for us, helped us to understand. In Mark chapter 10, verse 18, he said, Why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. Do you see the problem? The problem goes beyond our struggle to do what is right. That's just the effect 
of the real problem. We're sick and dying. We struggle with evil because we have been infected with the knowledge of evil. It has altered our DNA. Our very bloodline has been hijacked with an incurable disease that results in death. It's imperative that we get this point. It's so important for us to grasp this in order to fully understand the profound impact of what Jesus did for us. You see, there's another picture in that book that tells a story that few truly understand. It's a picture of God the Father standing before Adam and Eve and the serpent. Many describe this moment as the moment where God punishes Adam and Eve for their sinful act. But that's not at all what happened. Let's read it again. Genesis 15, 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Before God even began to talk to Adam and Eve about their symptoms and what they should expect to experience as a result of ingesting the poison of evil, what was going to happen to their bodies, he started by giving them hope. He told them that he was going to fix everything and destroy the one that had done this to them in the process. Right here in this verse... God laid out his plan to save humanity from the deadly disease. Let's look at it again. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. God said the seed of the woman. Now, biology helps us to understand that this is an impossibility. And I'm not going to break it down for you. But God was saying that a virgin would conceive and bear a son, the Son of God. Because Jesus did not have an earthly father, his blood was not tainted with the same virus that had been passed down through the seed of Adam to all of mankind. Although he was living in a body that was dying because of his mother Mary, the blood running through his veins was the antidote that was needed to cure humanity of their deadly disease. Give the Lord praise. In order for his blood to cure us, Jesus had to live a sinless life and die an innocent death. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15, it says, the high priest of ours, this high priest of ours, talking about Jesus, understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Let's, let's get back to the story there in the garden with God and Adam and Eve. Let's continue with what he said. He, this is what God said, he, the son of God born of a virgin, will crush your head and you, the head of the serpent, and you, the devil, Satan, will strike his heel. In this statement, God was saying that Satan would try to kill Jesus, but that his attempt would lead to his own destruction. Because Jesus died an innocent man, his blood poured out for us, became the life-giving source of healing for the redemption of all of mankind. Though Satan had Jesus nailed to a cross, 
and brutally murdered. Though Jesus was placed in a tomb where his body lay dead for three days, the blood of Jesus was even more powerful than death. The blood of Jesus was the antidote that destroyed the virus that it infected the DNA of humanity. Though the devil thought that he had won by crucifying the Son of God, he only sealed his fate. As Jesus hung upon the cross, with his final breath, he proclaimed, it is finished. I can just see the look of terror that crept across the face of the devil as chills ran up and down his spine in hearing those words uttered. Although Jesus' body lay dormant in the tomb, his spirit was very much alive. For the next three days, Jesus entered the very pit of hell and waged war on every demonic realm. After defeating every demon in hell, with one final blow, Jesus knocked Satan to the ground as he placed his heel on the head of that serpent. I can hear Jesus command him, give me the keys. Give me the keys. I want you to see this. I can just see Jesus standing there with his hands raised high as he holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and as he delivered the final bone-crushing blow to the skull of that serpent, he said, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. There's another picture in that storybook. It's the picture of a tomb with a great stone sealing the entrance. In front of the stone are Roman soldiers standing guard, preventing anyone from entering or exiting. I find this fascinating. What was it about Jesus that caused them to be so afraid that they would go to such great lengths to keep him in the tomb? The Roman government, after being persuaded by the Jewish leaders, had the tomb sealed shut with a great stone in front of it that would have been impossible for even a few men to try to move. Even after doing all of that, they still were so worried that they had elite Roman soldiers placed to guard the tomb 24-7. Friday night, there was a terrible storm. The ground even shook. An earthquake. The sky was completely black and dark. There was thunder and lightning, the rain was pouring down in in sheets. It was was a terrible storm, but it passed without any real damage. Saturday was eerily quiet. No one seemed to be moving. Everyone stayed in their homes. Even the birds and the animals seemed to be mourning Jesus' death. Saturday night came with the moon and the stars shining above, but something just fell off. That night, the guards felt anxious as they recalled the events of the last few days. One of them began to remind the others of the rumor that Jesus would rise again in three days. 
This only caused them to be on higher alert to every sound, every shadow, wondering if the rumors were true. The night guards were all too happy to see the morning crew coming to replace them. As they all stood there about to hand off the watch to the next group, they couldn't have anticipated what was about to happen. As Jesus took that final crushing blow to Satan's head, proclaiming, it is finished. Suddenly, the ground began to shake as the impossible became a reality. This Jesus, who had died a sinner's death and was placed in a tomb for three days, arose to life as the conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. Death had been defeated. Sin had no power over him. The grave could not hold him. Every demon in hell was destroyed. The head of that evil serpent was crushed by the one and only risen Christ. King Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave. He is risen. He holds the keys. As the scripture says, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Death has been swallowed up in victory. Somebody give Jesus praise today. Come on. Hallelujah. I want to hear you shout, He lives. Come on. He lives. Jesus is alive. Give Him glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus lives, and because we, he lives, we have been given eternal life. Jesus died to save us. He poured out his blood on the cross and restored us back to life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Yes, evil is still all around us. Yes, this physical body will pass away. But it's only temporary. Just as a caterpillar enters a cocoon only to reemerge, transformed into a glorified body, so it is with those who place their faith in Jesus. The tomb is not the end. The tomb is not the end. Because he lives, we will live also. John chapter 1, verse 12 says this. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. If we receive him, if we receive his salvation, his blood is applied to our lives so that even though we may die, we will be raised to life again as a new creation. Will you place your faith in Jesus today? Will you receive the life-giving antidote that he offers through his death and resurrection. The way that we receive Christ is by believing in him. 
Jesus came to offer us hope. He is our only hope. Will you receive him today? With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, if you would like to place your faith in Jesus today, I would ask you to pray with me. It's a simple prayer. It starts your new life as God's child. If you would like to pray with me to receive Christ today, would you let me know by just slipping up your hand right where you are? See that hand? See those hands? See those hands? From across the building. Thank you. you can put your hands down. Listen, this is the most important decision that you could ever make in your life. It determines eternity for you. So I'm going to ask everyone to pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I am convinced. I am persuaded. I believe in you. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose again with all power. I believe that one day you will return. Today I choose to give my life to you. I choose to trust you. I choose to receive you as my Lord and Savior. From this day forward, I am yours. I belong to you. I choose to receive your gift of life. I choose to be your child. And I receive you as Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise for that? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you made that decision today, this is the beginning of a new journey. We have a special gift for you. Be sure to stop by the Welcome Center before you leave. We want to be able to bless you with that gift and, and let you know what the next steps are. Speaking of next steps, we have a baptism service coming up in a couple of weeks. So if you'd like to get baptized, be sure to stop by the Welcome Center and sign up. Sign up. Give them your name and your information so that we can let you know the process for that. But we're excited. Are, were you glad you were here today? Can you just stand to your feet? Can we sing that song, He Lives? Come on, let's sing this.
I don't know about you, but I feel like celebrating Jesus this morning. Let's do one more right before we head out to celebrate. How many of you know that Jesus called us out of darkness into his marvelous light? Come on, put your hands together in this place. I would spare me beneath my sin. Oh, who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Breathing but not alive. All my failures I try to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You call my name. So much for taking the time to connect with us today. We hope that this message spoke to your heart. You know, life is a journey and our destiny is determined by every step that we take. If you took that first step in your faith journey today by receiving God's free gift of salvation, we want to celebrate with you. Yes, would you 
help us celebrate you by taking the time to reach out to us. We want to encourage you and pray with you. You know, God has a plan and a purpose for your life, but you were not meant to do life alone. You were made for community. If you don't have a church to call home, we would like to invite you to consider making 24-7 your church family. Join us at Grow 24-7 to learn about membership and all of the ways you can connect with us. Grow in your faith, discover your purpose, and live out your faith in community. Connect, grow, discover, live. It's that simple. It has been our honor to serve you today. We love you and we are praying for you. And there is always a place for you here. Be blessed.